water. They're claiming a possible 28% efficiency. Now, my question to them was... Of the at least, PV? Of the PV, right. Wow. Yeah. My question to them is, okay, this is a great idea. I don't want to even look at the complexity and design, but what happens when your, your, your load or your demand is met and your pumps turn off and your fluids sit up in here stagnating at 200 degrees? Then what happens to your efficiency? So it's a nice idea in, in theory, but I'd like to see some long-term uh, couldn't you vent the that. heat? You couldn't you just keep it running and vent the heat with a fan? Well, you could. You could theoretically, you could dump it. You could put it into a, a dump load and have some sort of a radiator. Um, yeah, that that is a means of doing that. Um, you know, again, complexity. And I'm a yeah. guy that likes to keep things simple. Keeps the callbacks down. Um, commercial solar PV applications, building integrated. Um, this is very practical for storefronts. By facial solar, where they're actually getting energy from the backside also, which is kind of interesting, very expensive. The upper left is a real practical way. I think, I don't know why it's not even being done more. I know out west it is. Again, this is a Midwest, but having canopies, every gas station should have solar modules on their canopy. I mean, that's, that's a no-brainer to me. And, um, but a lot of flat roofs, we all know the potential here, so this is an old argument. For residential settings, uh, if you have the yard space available, you can go PV ground mount. This is uh, my array at my house, uh, three kilowatt array. It takes a space uh, 30 feet wide by roughly 10 feet front to back. We can go pole mounts, which I think is a nice idea because it makes it easier to mow around and some people can actually integrate. If you notice the shading, they'll just set up a lawn chair and a table and have a little picnic area behind their solar array. And then a tracking solar, um, which is nice. Um, I'm not a real big fan of them anymore for this area, especially for passive trackers. This is a passive tracker, which works a little differently than an electronic tracker. And for our climate extremes that we have here, the passive trackers work very well in the summertime, really don't do a whole lot in the wintertime. So you have to either manually turn them or anchor them in a south-facing position so you lose any benefits that you spent your big money on. And with the price of solar modules nowadays, I'm thinking that it's probably less expensive in the long run to go ahead and just add a few extra modules rather than worry about the maintenance and the troubleshooting on a tracker, especially an electronic one because if you get any nearby lightning strikes or worse yet even a direct hit then you're going to spend a thousand dollars to replace the components on an electronic tracker and so any kind of return on investment goes right out the door. And then we have our typical uh, roof mount systems. This is an a, a 11 kilowatt system indicator and um, but again it's, uh, it's a pretty good size system blends in reasonably well. He wanted even more panels and I had to turn them down. I hate doing that. Mm -hmm. So we we'll look at the different types of systems. A very simple, the least expensive way to go if you want to get into solar is a utility interactive solar PV, grid tie, whatever you want to call it, where we basically take the output, which is normally high voltage DC current, which, um, and we're not talking micro inverters here, but in a, in a standard type system, we are running between 350 to 500 volts DC, which is fed into a utility interactive inverter, which will take that DC and invert it to utility grade AC power. That is then um, wired into, hardwired into your electrical system in your house. The electrons will go into your home to power any loads in your home. If you are producing more energy than what you are using. The electrons then will go out into the grid and your meter will, in effect, turn backwards. This is a six kilowatt system. Uh, you can see the utility interactive converter here. You can see this uh, one of the meter readings here. This is a, uh, an Ameren meter, which uh, in a bi-directional mode will show the arrow going to the left when you're feeding back into the grid, which is a really nice thing. 
It will be on the right side if you're feeding or if you're pulling from the grid. Everybody wants to see it in this direction. And again, notice the um, uh, Ameren has a requirement, as do most utilities, and you can't really see it here, but there's a safety disconnect here by their utility meter. They want signage, and we always supply a kilowatt hour meter so the client can really watch the meter spin backwards because it, we, we do supply one of the old analogs and everybody likes to watch those because solar is really boring. It has no moving parts, it's very reliable, it doesn't make noise, it doesn't dance around. And so everybody always wants to know, is it really working? So we'll say, well, yeah, look at the meter. If it's spinning, it's working. So they're good with that. And then we have um, bimodal, bipolar, battery-based, grid intertie, a lot of different uh, terminology. So the configuration is totally different, a lot more parts and pieces. We have the uh, battery, which is the heart of the system. So now we're also running at lower voltages because typically with a battery-based system, we're running at 12, 24, 48 volts. And so we're taking the energy off that array, which can run up to um, 130 volts uh, when you factor in ambient temperature. And, but we have to break that, take that 130 and bring it down to 12, 24, 48. So we have a charge controller, which will um, if it's a PowerPoint tracking charge controller, can take that voltage, bring it down to whatever your battery voltage is. Your inverter will then take the energy off the battery and invert it to utility grade AC power. The power can either go into your home, back into the grid. However, the difference with this system is if the grid goes down, your inverter then which will have a built, normally have a built-in transfer switch, will be totally pulling off the battery. It will isolate itself from the grid so it doesn't island into the grid, and you can still run whatever loads you have on in your home. The disadvantages, uh, much higher cost, typically two-thirds higher than a standard grid tie system because of the cost of the batteries. There is some maintenance involved because you do need to check your battery connections and um, if you have the flooded lead acid batteries, you do need to water the batteries once a month. But they're really nice to have when the grid goes out. And we've done um, three systems this year like that. This is an example of one where you see the grid tie inverter um, here, the charge controller here, because we do have to watch how much energy the batteries are getting. We can very, quite easily overcharge and ruin a battery. So there's a, it's a safety means. These are sealed batteries. They don't require maintenance, which is typically the way uh, we like to see things go, and it makes the clients happy. And notice the little screen here, sell the grid. His batteries are full, so he's putting his excess energy into the grid. But he's got the batteries there. In this case, it's a, this is a 20 kilowatt hour bank, so he has two or three days worth of energy stored in the batteries in case the grid goes down. Um, this is what's called a, a combiner box. Uh, in an off-grid or battery-based system, you'll have to have a combiner box to, again, series and parallel the um, grid or the, the uh, energy coming off the array. And then standalone, similar to um, a, a bimodal, but we're not tied into the grid. Again, the battery's the heart of the system and the inverters, uh, a good quality one, you can get that will put out uh, a very tightly uh, manufactured um, utility grade AC output, but it's, again, it's not going into the grid. Or you can go to Farm Fleet and Rural Keen and get a very cheap square wave inverter that will make a lot of noise and only last six months, but it can be done. And this is an example of a standalone system, and they have the flooded lead acid batteries, and they really hate to water those every month. And then all your equipment now, especially for grid tie use, should be UL listed to 1741 and IEEE to 1547. And any install should meet the suggested code practices, Article 690 of the National Electric Code. I'll skip that. This is an example of two systems in the area. Um, it gives you an idea of what the potential is here. A six kilowatt system in Rantoul. They're averaging 625 kilowatt hours a month. This is a fixed angle array running at um, about 40 degrees 
actually probably more about 40 to 43 degree angle, and their peak output is actually in September, 3.6 kilowatt array, but they're averaging 400 kilowatt hours a month. And that's it.